On this episode, faith works in our eternal promise. Hello everyone, and welcome to Live Through Jesus with Courtney Gilmore. I'll be reading all the scripture references for you, so you're free to just sit back, listen, and absorb, or you can grab your Bible and read along. Most of the time, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but if I switch, I'll let you know. At the beginning of each episode, I'll introduce the titles, so if you want the entire study in writing, you can go to livethroughjesus.com and buy it for under $5. Each one will cover two to three months' worth of episodes, and once you buy, then it'll be immediately available for download. In addition to a little extra studying, it also allows you the benefit of some charts and keyword definitions, but it isn't necessary. Okay, so let's get started. This is episode 14, and today we'll be going over lesson 5 of the Abraham study. Last episode, we read in Genesis 14 about a battle that Lot got involved in, and Abram rescued him from captivity, and then met with the king of Salem. And the king of Salem is mentioned in Hebrews 7 and is compared to Jesus. And so we talked about how Jesus is our priest and our king and also our sacrifice. So if you happen to miss that episode, you might want to go back and listen to it. It's always good to remind ourselves exactly what Jesus is to us and all of the things that he's done for us. So that's what we talked about last week. We're going to pick up this week after the battle and the meeting with the priest and king of Salem in Genesis 15, beginning in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my own house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Okay, so we're going to stop right there. Abram has just rescued someone from battle. And so God has come to him, giving him comfort. This is the first mention of God speaking to anyone in a vision, but it happens often throughout the Bible where God comes to someone in a vision. And he just wants to remind Abram that he's with him and there's nothing to worry about. But Abram immediately seems very confused. God's been telling him for a good long while now all of these things that are going to come about, and Abram just doesn't understand how that's going to happen. And so he tells God, I just don't understand. You keep saying this about my family is going to inherit this land, but I don't have any family. I guess my heir is going to be my oldest servant. That's all that I can think of. And this was common practice back then. If you didn't have any children, then the person that you would leave everything to would be your household servant, someone that you have had in your home for a long time and that you trust. But it's nice to know that Abram is just able to say, I'm just confused. I don't understand. And the thing is that a lot of times we think to ourselves that we can't do that with God because we're supposed to be proper about everything that we do. But he knows our thoughts anyway. And as long as we're not questioning his character and we're truly just trying to understand things, God wants us to do that. He wants us to say, I do not understand. Can you please help me comprehend what is going on here? We may not always get the answer that Abram does. God may not tell us what he's doing. Oftentimes he doesn't. But a relationship with someone is open and you tell your feelings and your thoughts. Anytime that I've gone to God and genuinely just expressed my feelings and thoughts, he's always been faithful to be understanding and comforting to me. And even if he doesn't give me the answers, he always gives me the strength that I need to make it through. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 40:29 through 31. He gives power to the weak 
and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God knows that we're going to be weak, that we're going to be tired. And it says that if we will just wait on him, we will just trust him that he will give us the strength to make it through the wait. And so it was just encouraging to me to read that Abram was able to express his feelings to God. So I think that that's something that we should take note of and remind ourselves to do. Because again, that's just what it is to have a relationship with someone. You talk through things. But notice what God's response is. He says, this man is not going to be your heir. You are going to have a child of your own. And then he tells him, Look up to heaven and see how many stars there are. If you could count them, that would be how many children you would have. Back in Genesis 13, 16, God told him that his children would be as many as the dust of the earth. And now he's telling him that it'll be as many as the stars in the sky. He's trying to explain to him, you will have a large family. This is not something you have to concern yourself with. I have a plan of how to fill this land that I'm telling you that you're going to inherit. And then listen to what it says in verse 6. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and God counted it to him for righteousness. So God said he was right just because when God told him something, he believed it. That's all he had to do in order to be righteous in God's eyes. This verse is quoted several other times. One of the times is in Romans 4, 1 through 5. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is counted to him for righteousness. So that right there tells us that Abraham was not justified. He was not set right by God for the things that he did, only for his belief. It says that our works just give us debt. We don't want debt. We want grace. Grace is just the gift of favor from God. And God will give us that favor if we just believe in him. That's what this verse is telling us. It's always good to look in other places of the Bible that talk about the things that happen in the Old Testament. That's the difference between studying and just reading something. Because when they quote this verse, they give a little more information about how that applies to our lives. It's also quoted in Galatians 3, 5 through 9. Listen to this. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So it's telling us right there that we are children of Abraham when we have faith in God too. And if we're his children, then we are found righteous just the same way that he was. Abraham was not justified or found righteous because of what he did, but only because of what he believed. His faith in God made him righteous. There is no way for us to work hard enough to be righteous in God's eyes because every single person does wrong in God's eyes. So if not for Jesus, God would look on us and he would see our good and our bad. But because of Jesus, we can put our sin on him And he can pay the penalty for that sin. And that sin can be nailed to the cross with him and buried with him. And then we, our new spirit, can rise again with him in the resurrection. And then when God looks on us, he is able to see our righteousness that Jesus has imputed on us. That's how we receive his grace, his favor, the reward that's given to us just by our belief. 
Listen to 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So Jesus took our sins, put them upon himself, and then they died on the tree with him. And now we are able to live for righteousness through him being healed of those sins. So if we want to be found righteous by God, that's the way we do it, through belief in Him and in Jesus as our Savior. Now, let's move on and see what Abraham's response to God is when God tells him, Eleazar is not going to be your heir. You're going to have your own child. It says in verse 6 that Abraham believed God and God counted that to him for righteousness. And then as soon as God finishes talking, Abraham says this in verse 8. Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit this land? That sounds a little confusing, right? It's like, how do I know that you're telling me the truth? After it just said that he believed him. So what does that mean? How do we reconcile that in our minds? Because those two things don't seem to go together. We have to assume that if God says that he believed and God counted it to him for righteousness, then he isn't saying he doesn't believe him. He's not saying, how do I know that you're telling me the truth? We have to assume that that's not the case. So he's not questioning if God's really going to do this. He's more just asking him, will you seal this with a covenant? You know, what do we do whenever someone tells us something? A lot of times we're say, promise. I want you to promise me. So he's like, promise me. Make a covenant with me. Seal this with your covenant. And let's see what God's response is. God says, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then Abram brought all these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he didn't cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. We're going to skip down to verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. So again, this is proof that Abraham was not doing anything wrong because whenever he says, seal it with a covenant, God says, okay, I will. I will make a covenant with you. That's what it says in verse 18. On that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. How wonderful God is that he understands what we need. And when we ask for it, even though it's like, I just told you, when we need reassurance, he isn't angry with us. He's able to just give that to us. Now, this little ritual seems very strange to us, right? Because we've never done anything like this. This is not something that we do whenever we make promises. We just sign a piece of paper, right? But this was common practice back then, and it had a lot of meaning. So what would happen is if two people were going to make promises to each other, then they would cut the animals in two, and they would put them on either side of each other. And then both of them would walk between the animals, reciting their promise to one another. And the reason that they would walk between these dead animals is it symbolized that if they did not keep their promise, then they would end up like these animals. In essence, it's like saying, cross my heart and hope to die, except for it's like, cross my heart and I will die if I don't fulfill my promise. When something is really important, we don't just say it. We say it and then we seal it with a promise. And this is a very important promise to the extent that if I don't keep it, I'm willing to die. So that was something that was common in those days to do for two parties. But what's so unique about this is that both of them did not pass through. If you notice, Abram does not walk through this. And Abram makes no promise. Abram has already done his part. All that he asked him to do was belief, and he did that. God is the one making the promise, and God's showing him, I am making this promise to the fullest extent. 
God is the burning torch that's passing through this. As he passes through, he says, This is my promise to you, that I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the river of the Euphrates to your descendants. All this land that all these different people that I'm going to name live in right now. All this land is going to be to you. That's my promise to you. He makes that promise as he passes through these animals as the burning torch. Going further than just telling Abram that this will happen, he is now sealing it with the ultimate promise. I'm just so thankful that God does things like that for us because he could just say, I already told you, but he understands that we need that reassurance sometimes. Now let's read what God also tells him beginning in verse 12. We're going to go back. I left this part for last because it's really just inspiring and it's what I want to end on. It says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell on him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that isn't theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for four hundred years. And also the nation that they serve I will judge. Afterward they will come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God tells Abraham here, you yourself are not actually going to inherit this land. It's going to be your descendants, but it's going to be after a long time. And then he gives him the story of his descendants and what's going to happen and when they are going to come back here. But even though Abram never gets to possess this land, he also never experiences this oppression that God is giving to his descendants. But instead, God tells him that he's going to be blessed through his whole life and he's going to die at peace at a good old age. So Abram has a wonderful life. And then he also has the blessing of knowing that his descendants will become a great nation and all of the earth will be blessed through them. Now, why would God not give this land to Abram whenever he's promising it to him? For one reason, we know he doesn't have much family yet. He doesn't have any family, really. He just has Lot and Sarah and all of his servants. And so that's one reason we know because this is a vast land and he doesn't have enough people to fill it. But also look in verse 16, it says, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God's telling him, this is going to happen, but it's going to happen after the iniquity of the Amorites is complete. It's not time yet. So God has a reason that he needs to wait. Something that Abram wouldn't know because the Amorites are of no concern to him. Oftentimes, we don't understand why we are waiting on something. It seems like something that he would want to give to us, so why do we have to wait for it? Why can't we just have it now? Here it tells us the answer to that just a little bit because it says, I have other people to think about, right? God says, I want to do this for you, Abram, and for your descendants, but I also have to think about the Amorites. I have other things to consider than just you and your family. Listen to Psalm 69, 13. It says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. This says, in the acceptable time. I'm asking you to do this in the acceptable time. So the psalmist knows that our time is not always God's, right? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God knows things that we don't, and his ways are best. And we have to just trust that. The easiest way for me to think about this is as a parent. When you have more than one child to consider, oftentimes what might be good for one child at one moment would be bad for the other one. And so as a parent, sometimes you have to say no or tell one to wait for the good of the other person. 
we aren't always just able to get what we want because there's other people to consider. That's where the phrase, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you came from, right? Because it's not all about us all the time. And you know, as kids, we don't quite understand that. But as you become an adult, you understand that in this world. But then whenever we ask God for things, we seem to forget that. We seem to forget that it's not all about us. He has so many things to consider, so many people, so many more people and things to consider than we do as parents of just a few children. You know, as you mature as an adult on this earth, you begin to understand that. And then when we mature in our spiritual life, that's when we begin to understand, hey, everything doesn't revolve around us. God has other people to consider. He knows what he's doing. For him to literally take every single piece of the puzzle and know exactly how they all fit together is incredible. But he is able to do that. He knows that. And we just have to trust him. So the last thing I want to talk about is my favorite part. Because notice how God tells him, they will inherit this land, but first, they're going to be afflicted. For 400 years, they're going to be oppressed, but don't worry because I will judge the ones that oppress them and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. So he's telling him, it's not going to be great the whole time. For a little while, things are going to be hard. But don't worry, because I'm going to judge these people that put them in this situation. And not only that, but they're going to come out richer than ever before. And then they're going to inherit this land that I have set aside for them all these 400 years before. And the reason I like this is just because <laughs> there have been so many times in my life where I've just said to God, you know, could you do this for me? Could you just tell me how it all ends? You know, how long is it going to be? If he'd just say, you know, Courtney, you're going to be afflicted, but it's okay because I'm going to judge the oppressor. And then at this exact time, then you're going to come out of it richer than when you went in. Me, in my human mind, I just think I could do that, you know? I think if God told me, even if it was a long time, if he would just say, Courtney, it's going to be bad for a while, but it's okay because you only have this many more months or this many more years, and then you're going to come out richer than you were before this all started. If I knew that that was the ending and I knew I only had a certain amount of time left and I could count that down, then it just seems like it would be so much easier, you know? I don't even care if God judges the one that's oppressing me, you know? That doesn't even matter to me. If I just knew that there was an end in sight and that the latter was going to be better than the former, you know, I think I could do it. Listen to this in Psalm 6, 3. Thankfully, I'm not the only one that feels like this. It says, my soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? And then again in Psalm 13, beginning in verse 1, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Psalm 79, 5. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. Psalm 84. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in great measure. You have made us a strife to our neighbors and our enemies laugh amongst themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine on us so that we will be saved. Yeah, I mean, it's just over and over. How long? How long? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever just said, how long? How long until this is over? How long? God, if you just told me how much longer I had to do this, I think I could make it. Right? Do you know the story of Job? How God allowed him to have everything taken away from him. And then at the end, he completely restores it all. Job is so sad. He goes through losing his family and all of the things that he has. And then listen to what God says to him at the end. Job 42.10, it says, The Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. And indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And then in verse 12, it says, And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And then it lists how many of all the things that God gives him. 
If we knew that, if we knew that our last days would be better than our first days, that we'd be better coming out than when we went in, wouldn't it be so much easier? You know, I just told God this so many times. How long, God? Show me how long so I know how much longer I have to do this. Let me know it's going to end and let me know that it's going to be better than it was before. That all of this suffering isn't it. Here's the thing. Most of us never get told what Abraham gets told. I mean, I've been asking him. He hasn't done it for me yet. He has not told me the time and the date. And what's hard is that we know that some people do die in their suffering. Some people do not find that peace here on this earth. Some people do not find an end to their hardships on this earth. But that's not the end of the story. Thank God that is not the end of the story. Because even if we never find that here on this earth, God assures every single believer, every single person that has believed as Abraham did, God counts that to us for righteousness too. And every single one of us, he assures us that our hardships on this earth are temporary and they will certainly come to an end. We have that promise. No doubt. God does tell us. He may not tell us what happens on this earth, but he tells us again. In Revelation 21, it tells us all about heaven. And it says that he will wipe away every tear and there will be no more pain. We know that when we leave here, there is an eternal inheritance, much richer than anything we can imagine on this earth. And in heaven, we will experience complete peace. And our oppressor, Satan, he will face absolute judgment from our defender, God. Revelation 19 and 20 tells us about that too, if you'd like to read that. So yes, on this earth, it seems hard. We want the hardships to end. But God says, this is just temporary. You know, he actually does tell us, he says, hey, it may be hard for this many years, but then... Then you will come to heaven and you will be with me and eternally forever you will experience joy and all of those hardships will be gone. And so he really does tell us it's only going to be for a small amount of time and then I will judge your oppressor and you will inherit a land that is richer than anything you had on that earth. It's just hard for us, right? Because this temporary doesn't feel temporary to us right now. It feels so important. We don't feel like we can make it another day sometimes, living in the way that we're living right now. But again, that just comes with spiritual maturity. When we become mature as Christians, then we begin to be able to see beyond the temporary. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 4, 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Well, what's more important, temporary or eternal? It's just hard for us to wrap our minds around sometimes. But God tells us exactly what he tells Abraham. He says that. He says it's only going to be a short time in the grand scheme of things. When you measure 60, 80, 100 years to eternity, that's nothing. So I hope that if you're like me and you've asked God how long, and if you want to know how it all ends, I hope that today you realize he told us if we will believe like Abraham, then he will count it to us for righteousness. And then our ending is joy eternal, an inheritance richer than all the pain, an inheritance even richer than the things that we had before the pain began. So let that encourage you today. He loves us and he has an inheritance prepared for us, just like he did for Abraham and his descendants. Next week, we're going to read Genesis 16, and we'll talk about where Abram and Sarah go from here. So make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss that episode. Feel free to email me at Courtney at LiveThroughJesus.com. If you've enjoyed this, give me a good review. Thanks, and have a good day.